All right, welcome back to the proofs slides. This is where we will end it. So right here, this will be the last lecture on these slides. We are going to move on after that. So the where we ended was we were talking about this thing called the contrapositive, which is equivalent to uh, the original implication. And so you could prove either one. One way might be easier than the other. If you replace if p then q with if not q then not p. So let me show you one way or one place where that is easier. So try it this way. Prove the following statement by contrapositive. So see if you can start it at least. Um, and then we will we will make it work. So uh, I do want to give you some hints so that you can have a good uh, a good try at it. But this is what we want to prove, and we also want to uh, I want to show you one thing. So uh, I think the first thing that I want to do is translate this to math for you, and then we can uh, visit the next slide. Okay. So for any integers x, y, and z, so there's three things. Oh man three things that we're quantifying over for all x, for all y, for all z. Uh, if x divides y and x does not divide z, so if x divides y and x does not divide z, we draw it with a little slash in it, then x does not divide, I guess I don't need parentheses, x does not divide y plus z. Okay, so that's what we're trying to show here. Uh, and we want to prove it by contrapositive. So let me show you that. So it's essentially, we're taking this and we are creating the contrapositive of it. Okay, well, let me show you that. Um, so we're actually, we actually have some more stuff to worry about this time. We have a, uh, it's not just P implies Q, it's like X and Y implies Q, right? So there's two things in the hypothesis. And that actually gives us some options. You don't have to like negate this and prove this. Um, there are some things that you can do to move it around. Okay, let me show you this. So yeah, totally, this is true. You can replace it with that. But uh, obviously, this looks a bit different. So maybe there's something else we can do, right? So uh, does it? Do we have to just do not r implies uh, not p and Q, right? Does, do we have to do that? So, uh, right, we end up with this, and that is equivalent to, right, this, because we can push in that negation using De Morgan's laws. Okay, so you can say in English if R is false, then P is false or Q is false. And so I guess I don't need this because I just wrote it again down there. Uh, so that's the equivalent, but we can actually do some stuff with this to make it maybe a little bit cleaner, right? It's actually true if uh, we can actually bring that P over in here and negate it, which is weird to think about, but this is equivalent to the above. Not R and P. If that, then not Q is the same. So if R is false and P is true, then Q is false. And I encourage you to think about this. Think about why it's true. Maybe draw, uh, use your rules, draw a truth table, but this is actually the form that we would like to prove, okay? That is a better way of doing things, in, uh, in my opinion, for this particular proof. So if we convert this to the contrapositive, let's do this. Uh, we have to, I'll get rid of the for alls for now. We have to negate this, right? That is, well, x does divide now, y plus c, if that. Then it's the negation of this, which is... Uh, negation of x divides y and x does not divide z. And so all that is equivalent to, uh, gosh, where do I want to write this? There's a lot going on here. So this bit, we can replace it with, um, let me just rewrite the whole thing. x divides y plus z, but it'll be small. If that then, negate this, so that is, uh, x does not divide y, or, right, because De Morgan's rule, or x does divide z. Okay, so that's what we can turn it into. And then the trick is to notice that we can move this over one more time. We can move it over into here because of this rule and negate it. Okay, so really what we'd like to show is one last time. If x divides y plus z, 
and the negation of this, because I can bring it over, and uh, x does divide y, then x divides z. And that is equivalent to the original statement, believe it or not. And the trick is, the reason we did that, the reason we wanted to do it, is because you don't really have a lot to work with when you know that something does not divide something else. This is was our way of getting rid of the does not divide symbol. Okay, because we only know how to extract information when things do divide from each other. We know that we have this uh, relationship. Okay, that was the reason. Okay, so there was a lot of work in that, but this is what I got us started with. And then you can unpack the definitions and try the proof. Okay, so now you're finally ready. Pause the slide, uh, pause the video, and try this slide out. Okay, well, I'll get some water. All right, so we, we came up with a good thing to prove, and let's prove it. So proof. We got to assume these two facts. Assume uh, x, uh, y, and z, they're integers, right? Because we have this still. I'm just forgetting to write it everywhere. Assume x, y, and z are ints. And assume this, and assume this, right? Assume all of that everything to the left. So assume x divides y plus z and x divides y. And now it's our turn to unpack this definition. And what we want to show, need to show, is that x divides z. If we just show this, then we are done. And that's a z, not a 2. Uh, so let's unpack these divides by definitions. We go back to the definition, look on that slide. Uh, what does this mean? x divides y plus z. So that means y plus z equals uh, k times x. x goes into it. And so we know that. And we also know this one, right? x divides y. So y equals some other integer, like m times x for ints k and n. Just unpacking those definitions for some ints k and m. So we have these facts, and now we need to use them to show that x divides z, okay? So what we want now, what do we want? Unpacking this definition. We need to show that x divides z, so we want, uh, maybe I should have put this in green as well. We want right now to show that uh, this, which expanded is uh, z equals I guess r, let's say, times x. Okay? So that's that's our final goal. That's equivalent to this. So if we can find an r for which this is true, uh, then we've solved the problem. Okay? So let's figure this out. All right, using what we know, we have all of this is true. So y plus c equals kx, right? y plus z equals um, let's see here. Well, I can use this definition to expand y equals mx plus z. And also, I know that y plus z, the whole thing, is kx. So I have this. I just gain this information, these, this equality. You see that? So that is where we can start. And if we solve this equation right here for... Uh, like bring the x's onto one side so I can subtract mx on both sides. Then let's do, uh, or we can solve it for z. That's what I'm trying to do here. z equals kx minus mx, uh, which is equal to k minus m times x. Ooh, what have I done? I've just shown that z is equal to something times x. Ooh, ooh. Um, is k minus m an integer? It sure is. That's all I needed. This is an int. Because it's the subtraction of two ints. Yay. And that's what we needed to show. So z is equal to k minus m times x. And k minus m is an int. And so that fulfills all of our definitions for this for uh, uh, finding some r, because this can be our r, that fills in this formula, which proves that x divides z. 
Okay, x goes into z, just like that. And so, since we've proven that, so x divides z, which is what we needed to show, and we have proven our entire proof. Okay? Did you get uh, some of this? Did you get this far at least? That's all that I care about right now. But hopefully, this is making some more sense. Okay? And this was a lot better to prove than the original statement. Okay, because we don't really have any information when we have these not divide by signs. Okay, we had to convert them, and the contrapositive got us there. All right, try this one. This one is a bit better, I would say, less words at least in the proof. So prove this by contrapositive for every non-real or non-zero real number x. If x is irrational, then one over x is also irrational. So. Uh, Irrational just means it's not rational. It can't be written like x over y for some x and y. So uh, that might be helpful because we're about to negate things. So we'll, we'll ask about rationality instead. So let's talk about this. So if x is rational, that's our p, then 1 over x is also irrational. That's our q. Okay, so we have that implies that. And let's negate. Let's make not q as our hypothesis. That is uh, 1 over x is, well, if it's not irrational, it, it's rational. 1 over x is rational implies negation of this, x is rational. And this is a lot easier to prove because we know what it means to be rational. Okay? So proof. Assume this, show this. Right? So we assume. Oh, we also assume non-zero, right? The number is non-zero. So assume x is non-zero. And uh, 1 over x is rational. So now we need to show, or just to show, um, x itself is rational. Out of the definition of rationality, boop, boop, boop. There are integers x and y such that y is not equal to 0 and r is equal to x over y. So we can find some ratio of numbers to equal that original number. That's what it means to be rational. All right. Uh, so 1 over x is equal to like m over n. That's what it means to be a rational number for some m and n, which are ints, uh, and also uh, n is not equal to 0 because you can't divide by 0. Okay, so we know all that. Uh, using that, right, remember that uh, but x is equal to 1 over 1 over x, right? And I know what that is. That's m over n. x is equal to 1 over m over n, which is just flip them, right? Which equals n over m. Isn't that nice? That's super nice. And it's non-zero, so I know that uh, that's going to work out. So 1 over x is non-zero, and so m over n uh, is also non-zero. So I'm allowed to divide by it, is what I'm trying to do, trying to say there. Same. So it's not undefined. Same for m over n. And uh, therefore, I found two numbers for which I can make x out of, and it's dividing them two into each other. So, so I found those two numbers, very related to the originals, right? So x itself must have been rational. And the weirdest thing just happened. We completed the proof, and we just proved things about irrational numbers, numbers that cannot be written like this which just seems crazy, but it is all correct because we proved by some equivalent thing, the contrapositive. Isn't that crazy? Uh, so to prove things about irrational numbers, we only had to consider rational numbers. Very odd, but uh, correct. All right. Uh, the l last, uh, maybe not the last, but the last very, very important way to prove something and that is going to come up a whole lot, this is like tied with direct proof, is 
also called indirect proof sometimes, which is fun. Uh, it's called proof by contradiction. Okay, this is key, key, key. This is not uh, obvious the way that it works, but it is very, very powerful. Okay, uh, so contradiction implies we're going to find falsehoods, right? So false things can help us prove true things. It's very odd, but it works. And so here is what you do when you want to prove something by contradiction. You assume that your entire theorem, what you're trying to prove, assume that it's false, okay? Assume that it's not true. And then you go and you find a contradiction to that. You show that, oh man, uh, under the assumption that my theorem is false, then pigs fly. And because obviously that's not true, that somehow proves the theorem, the original theorem, okay? It's like, oh, well then this must have been true then. And this is actually a valid thing to do. Let me show this to you. So if your theorem is Q, you prove this. You assume you prove not Q implies false, right? You uh, assume that your theorem is false, and then find a contradiction. Finding a contradiction, finding a contradiction is the same as proving that this whole thing is true. False is true. It's odd, but it makes sense. Okay, so let me uh, show you this and why it makes sense. So. This is equivalent to not Q implies false, is equivalent to true implies Q, contrapositive, uh, which is actually equivalent to just Q. So if you prove this, you have also proven Q. Isn't that weird? Uh, another way to derive that conclusion is uh, through our rules. This is the same as not not Q uh, or F, right? Using that rule to get rid of a, an implication. and. Anything ORed with false is just the thing on the other side, so it's not not Q, uh, and that is just Q. Weird, huh? And then, yeah, that's all you need to think about. And this is equivalent. True implies Q is equivalent to Q because true implies Q is the same as not true or Q, which is the same as false or Q, which is the same as Q for the same reason up here. Weird. So assume that your theorem is false and show that Something doesn't make sense. Find a contradiction. Prove that false was true. Should never be true. Odd, right? So your goal is to prove that false is true, and that will show that your original theorem was true. Okay, so what does it mean, you might be wondering, to prove that false is true? Here is what it is. False usually happens when you find a contradiction, of course, but what does a contradiction mean? Uh, it's when you have two things at once. You have a thing and its negation. You know that both are true. You've proven that both of those things are true. Two contradictory things, okay? It's impossible for them to both be true, right? P and not P. That makes no sense. That cannot be true ever, right? Because one's true, the other's false. Always. And it together, it's always false. So you have just proven false based on that. You see that? And at that point, hey, you're done. And so uh, it seems weird. It seems like there's something left out, but it is correct. And because it feels a little odd and like things are left out, we call it indirect proof. All right, so let me give you some examples. So the first is about birthdays. This will come up later in the class when we talk about uh, combinatorics as well. But let me prove this theorem to you using contradiction, using a proof by contradiction. So uh, among any group of 25 people, so like the students in this class, there must be at least three who are all born in the same month. OK, so let's uh, let's think about that. So what's the original theorem statement? Because we got to negate it, right? Uh, among any group of 25 people, there must be at least three who are all born in the same month. OK, so. Uh, what can we do about that? So that's like uh, there is some month, call it, I don't know, call it M, <laughs> I'm not sure, such that uh, there are at least three people, so greater than or equal to three people who are born in that month M. That's my math version of that. Okay, and so then it's our job to negate that. And then we can go to, uh, OK, what does that mean? Uh, well, I guess that's a for all. We negated it, uh, there exist. It becomes a for all. So we have to show then, uh, or assume this, and then find falsehood. So uh, because this is a proof by contradiction. This is our original proof. We are assuming that it's not true and deriving a contradiction. So here is what it would mean to assume that it's not true. So assume that, instead, for all months m, 
uh, less than three people are born in M. So we're assuming this and showing that a contradiction arises, that something uh, can derive false. Quite odd, but that is that's how it's working. So proof. And just because proof by contradiction is so weird, we like to alert our readers. We say by contradiction a lot of the time. To just make it clear that this is going to feel weird, but it will work. Um, so by contradiction. So this is what's going on. We're assuming this. Assume this whole thing is true. Uh, and here's the best mathy way that I came up with to, to write this out. So let's assume that we have a group of people. So let G be a group of people of uh, 25 people. And let's assume the negation of our theorem is true about that group of people. So assume that less than three people uh, in G were born in each month. So that's this theorem. We're assuming that it's true. It's a negation of our original one. And then we have to derive a contradiction. We have to prove that false is true. OK, so assuming this, can you find the contradiction there? So if this is true, then the max number of people in G, right, then the max number of people in G is, well, you got 12 months, less than three people born in each month. So at most two, uh, that's 24. Hey, hey. You just told me that the group was full of 25 people, though. That's a contradiction. So the, there can't be uh, at max 24 people and also 25 people. You see how that's a contradiction? So in a theorem, in a theorem that you're proving, sometimes uh, in a book they'll say contradiction at this point, usually with an exclamation point because it's so exciting. Uh, other times there's a special symbol for contradiction for that word. It's like a lightning bolt. So it looks like that. That also means contradiction. Uh, either way. But that's our proof. We have just assumed the negation of the original thing, derived a contradiction, so that means that the original theorem was true. You see that? It kind of leaves something unsaid. It feels like it's lacking in some way, but it is a correct proof. We have proven exactly what we wanted to. It is not an incorrect theorem at all. OK? But it feels weird. All right. Uh, so the next thing that I want to show you is uh, how to negate an if-then statement, especially when there's a lot of uh, things in the hypothesis that are anded together. So let me show you this, because eventually we're want, going to want to create the negation of that to use in a uh, proof by contradiction. So all right, if we're negating something that looks like this, that's equivalent to this, actually, with enough maneuvering. And that's useful because it's just a bunch of things we get to assume, right? Assume all these things are true. Isn't that nice? So no more if then. So we want this, and we want to uh, negate it, right? Oops, sorry. Uh, let's see. What do I want to do here? Oh, I wanted to negate the whole thing. Excuse me. So that was supposed to be like that. There. So start with this. So we're negating it. And that is, well, using our rules. It's the knot of the hypothesis ORed with the conclusion. And then we can bring in some double negations, because you got to bring in this negation inside there. Boop. And that's the one that's affecting. Uh, and that becomes a double negation here, ended with not D. And so the double negation goes away, and it's, we're left with this. So if you want to assume this in a proof by contradiction, you can just assume this. Isn't that nice? And this could, of course, be anything on the left-hand side. I'm just showing you, like, if you have a bunch of stuff anded together, you keep it, and you just assume that the hypothesis is false. OK? So that's useful, uh, and it'll come up later. Uh, now I'm about to show you probably the coolest example in these slides. OK? We're going to prove, it's a very classic one, that the square root of 2 is an irrational number. It cannot be written as a ratio of integers. It goes on and on and on forever. So here's our theorem. The square root of 2 is irrational. It's going to be great, right? 
Uh, remember that rational numbers look like this, like 5 out of 10. That's uh, is equal to 1 over 2 and things like that. Uh, those are rational numbers. The square root of 2 is irrational. And actually, that re reduction process is going to become important in the proof itself. It's going to be awesome. So we're not yet actually ready to prove this. We, we need something called a lemma, which we'll prove on the next slide first. Okay. And so you'll hear this word a bunch. A lemma is, uh, think of it as like a little theorem. It's, it's one that you're using to prove some more important thing. So it's like a screwdriver. It's like a crowbar. Uh, and like this is the car. All right. So a lemma is just a tiny little theorem that we're going to use to help us in our original theorem. All right. So we want, let's prove this. And it will become apparent soon. I'm going to use it in the original theorem. So if x squared is even, then x itself must have been even. Okay, so let's prove this. And actually, the proof is most easily done using the contrapositive. So negate this, if that, then negate that. Okay, so what's the negation of the conclusion? So assume that x is odd. And so then we're going to show that x squared is odd. Okay. And that is proving it by the contrapositive. So if x is odd, then x is equal to 2k plus 1 for some integer k. Don't need to write that right now. And then I want to square it, right? Because I'm going to show that uh, x squared is odd as well. So x squared, that's equal to, well, 2k plus 1 squared. Oh, man which is 4k squared plus uh, 4k plus 1. Trust me, I did the math before. Um, which is equal to, I can take out a 2 of these, equal to 2 times k squared plus k plus 1, uh, which it, in fact, oh, sorry. I can take out a 2, and I'm still left with some 2s, aren't I? 2k squared, sorry, plus 2k plus one, that is correct now. Uh, and what do you know, but in this number in here, that's an integer, right? I didn't do any weird uh, things with numbers. This is just multiplying and adding with existing integers. So that number itself is an integer, and that is the number that I could use to show that like x squared is odd, because I got two times an integer plus one. So unraveling all the definitions, so x squared is odd. Cool. That was my original theorem. Uh, even though I proved things about even things, uh, in my actual proof, I needed odd stuff. And that was the contrapositive working. It was easier to do this way. But all right, now we have this. We know that this is true, so we can use it in our original proof. So feast your eyes on this wonderful, wonderful example of a proof by contradiction. Square root of 2 is irrational. All right, so proof. Well, it's going to be by contradiction. So we're going to assume the opposite of this theorem. Contradiction. All right, therefore, assume square root of 2 is rational. Then we're going to show that a contradiction arises. What does it mean to be rational? Well, that means, so uh, square root of 2 must equal, if, if we're assuming it's rational, then it must equal a over b for some integers a and b. Some a and b. And also, we can tack on some information to this a and b. Because, I mean, we know they exist. But you know something else that you can do to fractions? You can reduce them. Like, 5 over 10 is equivalent to 1 over 2, right? Uh, we just know that square root of 2 is equal to some a over b. Uh, we can also, on top of that, assume that it's equal to a over b that has already been reduced. OK, it can't be reduced anymore. Like, 5 over 10, uh, for example, let's say, I don't know, 10 over 20 can be reduced to 5 over 10, but it's not fully reduced yet. 1 over 2 is fully reduced, right? So let's tack that on, actually. And this will become powerful for some a over b such that, assume that math did the work for us. Assume that we did the work. 
uh, such that uh, a over b is a fully reduced fraction. Can't be reduced anymore. Okay, because like I could take out a five here, I could take out a two here. Can't take out anything anymore. So assume that this a and b is already reduced. It's totally fine. You can automatically reduce a fraction even if you didn't know what it was. So just assume that that's been done, and that will actually give us the theorem. Believe it or not. So um, using this, square both sides. So we know that two is equal to a squared over b squared. Cool. Uh, and based on that, we can solve for something like we can put them all on one side. So two b squared, right? Two b squared is equal to a squared. Uh, so what does this mean? Two b squared equals a squared. This number is equal to two times some other integer. So a squared is even, unraveling that definition. That wasn't obvious, but we need it, uh, and it will be useful. So a squared is even. Uh, by the lemma on the next slide, is everything working together? This is the, the most exciting proof that I can give you right now. So this lemma will tell us if I have a number that's even, then a uh, number squared that's even, then that original number two is even. So by the lemma, I know that this is even, so therefore, A is even. A itself is even. Cool. Uh, okay, okay, okay. So A is equal to uh, 2 times K for some integer K. Uh, okay, okay, okay. I also know this. Let's unravel using this definition. Uh, so 2B squared is equal to 2K squared, because that's A squared now which is equal to 4k squared, oh man, oh man, oh man. Uh, using this, I can solve for b squared, right? So b squared divided by 2 equals this divided by 2, 2k squared. You see how this is unraveling? Uh, again, now b squared must be even. You see that? Because it's equal to 2 times some integer. So b squared is even. And this just seems like we're going nowhere. But that is actually essentially the end. We have found a contradiction. Do you see it? So uh, because we know this, b is also even by the lemma again. We have a number squared. We have proven that any number squared, uh, if that's even, then the original number was even. So b is even too by the lemma. Uh, cool. Uh, that means b is equal to 2 times m, let's say, for some integer m. Uh, and what do you know? Square root of 2, then, is equal to a over b, which is equal to 2k over 2m. Do you see the contradiction now? a over b is equal to this. But that is not fully reduced, is it? That means you could have reduced it further, but you didn't. You told me that it was fully reduced already. That is where the contradiction lies. This can still, you can bring out a two, right? This can still be reduced. Yay. So it wasn't fully reduced, even though we assumed it was. Contradiction. We have this and the negation of it, QED. Therefore, the square root of 2 is an irrational number. Is your mind blown yet? So that uh, is definitely the most exciting proof in these slides. Um, I hope you followed it. So definitely try this out on your own. See if you can follow each little step that I made. Was it all logical? Did it make sense? Uh, even though I told you like some things had to be done, does it make sense how we got the final answer? Right. That's the important thing. Understand how to unpack all those definitions. And that is the most important bit. So we have just proven a very important theorem. You should uh, sit back and relax and enjoy that fact for a little while. All right. When you're ready, come back to the video. And I have an example for you now. So try and prove this statement by contradiction. So if a group of nine kids have won a total of 100 trophies, all right, so nine kids uh, together, you add up all the trophies that they've won for some sport, I guess. 
uh, it adds to 100, then at least one of the nine kids won at least 12 trophies. Okay, so we have something to say about uh, one of the kids and how many trophies they got. Okay, so think about this and prove it by contradiction. Okay, remember that you got to negate things. So what does that mean? So we have to assume that uh, like the negation of this whole thing is true and then uh, show that we can find a contradiction. So here is the proof, proof by contradiction. So what's the negation of this? So if, if this, then this. So actually the negation, remember, um, the easy negation is the hypothesis is assume that like that is true and the negation of the conclusion is true. So you don't have to worry about implication anymore. So just assume this and uh, assume the whole hypothesis and that the conclusion of that hypothesis was false, okay? So let's assume this then and not this part. You see that? So assume that uh, you got your nine kids and they have 100 trophies. Uh, Assume the negation of this. Assume at least one of the nine kids has won at least 12 trophies. Uh, so the negation of that is that every kid won less than, strictly less than 12 trophies, right? So assume all nine kids won strictly less than 12 trophies. You see how that's the negation? You see that this part's still true, but the negation is right here. We've negated that, that conclusion. All right, uh, so that's at most 11, right? Trophies that every kid has in that case. So then, just like before, the same kind of uh, example with, okay, then we, we can say something about the max number of trophies that were allotted to these kids, and it doesn't come out to be the 100 anymore, okay? So then the total, number of trophies given out was at most because you got nine, nine kids right nine times strictly less than 12 11 that's 99 you see that so but there were a hundred trophies you said but there were a hundred trophies total Exclamation point. Contradiction. All right. Assume this. Found the negation. That makes false. Therefore, the original statement must have been true. So there's got to be one kid who can, who won at who won at least twelve. Uh, as of the minimum. Maybe some kid won a lot more, but somebody at least has twelve because that's the only way it could add up to hundred. You can't have like fractional trophies or anything. Does that make sense? Did you get it? Definitely come yell at me in office hours if any of this is not making sense. But this is cool stuff. Important stuff to know how to prove things. All right. Let me talk to you about a few more of these options that you have when you're proven. And that will be it for today. The next thing I want to show you is proof by cases, which is really not too bad. Uh, this is when you're proving a for all again. For all x in some domain, p of x is true. Uh, sometimes, like, you know, the normal way to prove this is to like pick out an arbitrary element of p's domain and prove that p is true for that arbitrary element so it works for everybody then so the for all itself is true sometimes it's hard to prove using just one arbitrary element you don't need to use just one as long as you cover all the domain okay that's what cases means so what you can do is you can split that domain of p into a bunch of different classes let's say classes of things types of things and if you give a different proof for each class it'll still work out right so like here's your domain and maybe it really nicely splits into like three groups or something this is your domain it could either be this this or this you can just give a separate proof for each three that's what proof by cases is and as long as you covered all of them you're good to go right so you can do a separate proof for each of these individual cases and that might be easier right so uh, for example like let's say that the domain of uh, like all of your x's, your your p uh, predicate is like the integers. 
then you could give a different proof for all the negative numbers, all the positive numbers, and zero. Maybe it's very, uh, like your predicate cleanly splits based on these, and it makes it easy to prove things. So as long as you cover all those different cases, all three, and you have a separate proof for each, then their combined proof is for everybody, for every integer. You see that? That's not too bad. So they all together, right? Together cover all the ints. Nice. Uh, OK, let me show you that. So here's one way to do things, some example. So let's define the absolute value of x to be x if x is greater than or equal to 0, so the same number if it's positive or 0, and negative x if x is less than 0. That is uh, the definition of the absolute value. And let's prove, using that definition, that every number, uh, its absolute value is greater than or equal to 0. Does that make sense? So this will be a tiny proof down here. And that's all the room we need, really. Uh, there's two cases, right? Because there are two cases to the definition. Ooh. So either x is greater than or equal to 0, or it's not. It's less than. All right? So that'll be our two cases. So case 1. If x is greater than or equal to 0, then, because we want to show this, right? Prove that for all x, absolute value is greater than 0. Then, based on the definition, the absolute value of x is x itself. And we already knew that was greater than or equal to zero because we assumed it. It was our case. <coughs> Excuse me. So that's case one, check. Um, case two, then we have uh, x is less than zero. And we have the absolute value of x. In that case, is negative x. And we have to show that that is greater than zero, greater than or equal to zero. OK? So what does that mean? Uh, well, we know this. We know that x is less than 0 in this case. And we just negated something that's less than 0. So what does that negation mean, right? You can negate an inequality, can't you? What's the negation of this? That is negative x. It flips, right, is greater than 0. So because we've negated something that we know is less than 0, we know that its negation is greater than 0, strictly greater than. And that's also, of course, greater than or equal to 0. You see that? That's my second case. And so we have just proven that the absolute value is always a non-negative number, which is what it should be, right? And that was by unpacking the definition and noticing that it was very nice uh, to separate into the two groups uh, where the absolute value was defined. One for the numbers where you didn't have to do anything, and one for the numbers where you had to negate it. Oops. See that? So that's proof by cases. Not too bad, I hope. Uh, and then, uh, before we have one last example of a proof by cases that I want you to try, I want to show you uh, a term that will come up. It's called uh, abbreviated, like w log, w log, whatever you want to say. Uh, it stands for without loss of generality. Okay? And let me show this to you. So sometimes you're proving something, you're going along. Two or more cases to your proof, you're going through proof by cases. Sometimes two of those cases or more are symmetric. And it's very, very obvious that both of those cases are true if just one of them is true. Like, so, like, here's your domain. You're trying to split it into multiple things and maybe more. But you have, like, this one case. I don't know. I'm going to draw the case of a proof as a person, because why not? Uh, and then, like, then you have this other case that looks exactly the same, just a little flipped, symmetric. And so it's obvious. Like, if I can just prove this one, it's obviously true for this one, because it looks the same. It's just slightly different. When it's obvious like that, you can just say, without loss of generality, let's assume we're in this case. And just prove that one. And then obviously this one will be true too. Does that make sense? It's trying. It's just a way to save yourself some writing as uh, when you're proving something. So it stands for without loss of generality. And let me show you an example, OK? For any two integers x and y, if x is even or y is even, then xy is even. And this is where w log is going to come into play. So uh, remember, if you're going to prove this, like you got to you have cases, right? Either x is even or y is even, and then you got to show that xy is even. So there's like two different proofs that you have to use here. But really, you only need one, right? Because it doesn't matter which of these was even. Like one of them is even. It doesn't matter which, because multiplication is commutative. Like I could have just written yx, and it didn't mean it mean the exact same thing, right? So uh, obviously, I only need to consider when one of these is even. It's not a big deal, because they're just letters, right? So here's the proof. Assume 
without loss of generality, you say, that x was the one that was even. So I can pick either of them, and it doesn't matter which, right? Because it's just a symmetric case if I do it the other way, right? Because usually you'd have to be like, okay, let's prove it when, okay, if x is even, then let's prove this, and then if y is even, then let's prove this. And it's the same proof, okay? I hope, I hope that makes sense, me saying it in a bunch of different ways. So assume without loss of generality that was x, that was even. And so we need to show that x, y is even. And uh, dun, dun, dun. then I'll show you why like this was OK to do if you're not seeing it yet. So then uh, if x is even, x is equal to 2 times k for some integer k as usual. And x, y is equal to, if we unpack this, 2 k, y, which is 2 times k times y together like that. And that's an integer, all mean. Uh, Therefore, x, y is even in that case. And notice that um, the reason this works and the reason you can say w log without loss of generality is because swapping x and y in that proof on the left proves the other case. <laughs> where y was even. Do you see that? Because of that, like it's the same proof, it's obvious, uh, then you can say without loss of generality. Okay, that's the trick. So uh, if you're ever in doubt, just prove both cases. It doesn't matter. Uh, but this will save you some writing sometimes. Okay, so that's without loss of generality. And then uh, the last uh, slide is for you. So try this. Try to prove this statement by cases. If integers x and y have the same parity, then x plus y is even, okay? And what same parity means is either both numbers are odd or both numbers are even. So maybe there's your cases, right? So give this a try, and then uh, I'll do it with you. All right, so welcome back. Let's see how we're doing. Um, Let's prove this by cases. In if integers x and y have the same parity, then x plus y is even. So either they're both even or they're both odd. And so let's prove both cases. And then once we've shown both, then we've shown the whole thing. So case one, they're where they're both odd. We'll prove that one. And then we'll do case two, where they're both even. And so we'll cover all our bases where they have the same parity. And then in both cases, we'll show that x plus y must have been even. Okay. So assume here x and y are both odd. And so I can pick out, just quickly unraveling those definitions, x is equal to 2k plus 1. And uh, y is equal to 2m plus 1. Those are my favorite filler variables. Um, and then x plus y is, of course, um, equal to this plus this. 2k plus 1 plus 2m plus 1, which is 2k plus 2m plus 2, which is equal to 2 times k plus m plus 1. And so there's an integer times 2 equal to x plus y, even. Okay. So x plus y is even. That proves this case. And then uh, if x and y were both even, we have the other case to prove still. So assume x and y are even. What happens in that case? So that means x is equal to 2k for uh, some k, and y is equal to 2m x plus y is 2k plus 2m, which is equal to 2 times k plus m. So that's another integer. Uh, times 2 equals x plus y. So in this case as well, x plus y is even. And that's my second case. Check, check. So once I got both, I've proven the full theorem. Okay. If integers x and y have the same parity, then x plus y must have been even. So I tried both cases. Either they're both odd or they're both even. In each case, it's still even. So I've got my result. Does that make sense? 
that is our final proof. So uh, I hope you enjoyed these proof slides, especially the uh, square root of 2 is a rational proof. This is, uh, it seems kind of magical, at least to me. I enjoy proofs because it's like you're proving some like fact about the universe that is absolutely true. It's kind of cool. So I hope you think it is too, and I will see you next week.